The Bluebird by John Burroughs. When nature made the bluebird, she wished to propitiate both the sky and the earth, so she gave him the color of the one on his back and the hue of the other on his breast, and ordained that his appearance in the spring should denote that the strife and war between these two elements was at an end. He is the peace harbinger. In him the celestial and terrestrial strike hands and are fast friends. He means the furrow, and he means the warmth. He means all the soft, wooing influences of the spring on one hand, and the retreating footsteps of winter on the other. It is sure to be a bright March morning when you first hear his note, and it is as if the milder influences up above had found a voice and let a word fall upon your ear, so tender is it, and so prophetic, a hope tinged with regret. Bermuda, 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 he seems to say, as if both invoking and lamenting, and behold, Bermuda follows close, though the little pilgrim may only be repeating the tradition of his race, himself having come only from Florida, the Carolinas, or even from Virginia, where he was found his Bermuda on some broad sunny hillside thickly studded with cedars and persimmon trees. <clears throat> In New York and in New England, the sap starts up in the sugar maple the very day the bluebird arrives and sugar making begins forthwith. The bird is generally a mere disembodied voice, a rumor in the air for t two or three days before it takes visible shape before you. The males are the pioneers and come several days in advance of the females. By the time both are here and the pairs have begun to prospect for a place to nest, sugar making is, maybe <clears throat> sugar making is over. The last vestige of snow has disappeared, and the plow is brightening its mold board in the new furrow. The bluebird enjoys the preeminence of being the first bit of color that cheers our northern landscape. The other birds that arrive about the same time, the sparrow, the robin, the phoebe bird, are clad in neutral tints, gray, brown, or russet. But the bluebird brings one of the primary hues and is the divinest of them all. This bird also has the distinction of answering very nearly to the robin redbreast of English memory and was by the early settlers of New England christened the blue robin. <clears throat> it is a size or two larger and the ruddy hue of its breast does not verge so nearly on an orange but, manner, but the manners and habits of the two birds are very much alike. Our bird has the softer voice but the English redbreast is much the more, much the more skilled musician. He has indeed a fine animated warble, heard nearly the year round about the English gardens and along the old hedgerows, that is quite beyond the compass of our bird's instrument. On the other hand, our bird is associated with the spring as the British species cannot be, being a winter resident also, while the brighter sun and sky of the New World have given him a coat that far surpasses that of his transatlantic cousin. It is worthy of remark that among British birds there is no bluebird. The cerulean tint seems much rarer among the feathered tribes than there than here. On this continent there are at least three species of the common bluebird, while in our wood there is the blue jay and the indigo bird, the latter so intensely blue as to fully justify its name. There is also the blue grosbeak, not much behind the indigo bird in intensity of color and among our warblers, the blue tint is very common. It is interesting to know that the bird, the bluebird is not confined to any one section of the country, and that when, when one goes west, he will still have the favorite with him. Still have this favorite with him, though a little changed in voice and color, just enough to give variety with marring, without marring the identity. The western bluebird is considered a distinct species and is perhaps a little more brilliant and showy than its eastern brother. And Nuttall thinks its song is more varied, sweet and tender. Its color approaches to ultramarine while it has a sash of chestnut red across its shoulders. All the effects, I suspect, of that wonderful air and sky of California and of those great western plains. Or if one goes a little higher up into the mountainous region of the west, he finds the arctic bluebird, the ruddy brown on the breast changed to a greenish blue, and the wings longer and more pointed in other respects not differing much from our species. 
The bluebird is uh, bluebird usually builds its nest in a hole in a stump or a stub, or in an old cavity excavated by a woodpecker, when such can be had. But its first impulse seems to be start in the world, in much more style. And the happy pair make a great show of house hunting about the farm buildings, now half persuaded to appropriate a dovecote, then discuss discussing in a wild, lively manner a last year's swallow nest are proclaiming with such much flourish and flutter that they have taken the wren's house or the tenement of the purple martin till finally nature becomes too urgent when all this pretty make-believe ceases and most of them settle back upon the old family stumps and knot holes and remote fields and go to work in earnest <clears throat> In such situations, the female is easily captured by approaching very stealthily and covering the entrance to the nest. The bird seldom makes any effort to escape, seeing how hopeless the case is, and keeps her place on the nest till she feels your hand closing around her. I have looked down into the cavity and seen the poor thing palpitating with fear and looking up with distended eyes, but never moving till I had withdrawn a few paces. Then she rushes out with a cry that brings the male on the scene in a hurry. He warbles and lifts his wing beseechingly, but shows no anger or disposition to scold and complain like most birds. Indeed, this bird seems incapable of uttering a harsh note or of doing a spiteful, ill-tempered thing. <clears throat> the ground builders all have some art or device to decoy one away from the nest, affecting lameness, a crippled wing, or a broken back, promising an easy capture if pursued. The tree builders depend upon concealing the nest or placing it beyond reach, but the bluebird has no art either way, and its nest is easily found. About the only enemies of the sitting bird or the nest is in danger of our snakes and squirrels. I know of a farm boy who was in the habit of putting his hand down into a bluebird's nest and taking out the old bird whenever he came that way. One day he put his hand in, and feeling something peculiar, withdrew it hastily, then it was instantly followed by the head of an enormous black snake. The boy took to his heels, and the snake gave chase, pressing him close till a plowman nearby came to the rescue with his ox whip. There never was a happier or more devoted husband than the male bluebird is. But among nearly all our familiar birds, the serious cares of life seems to devolve almost entirely upon the female. The male is hilarious and demonstrative, the female serious and anxious about her charge. The male is the attendant of the female, following her wherever she goes. He never leads, never directs, but only succeeds and seconds and applauds. If his life is all poetry and romance, hers is all business and prose. She has no pleasure but her duty, and no duty but to look after her nest and brood. She shows no affection for the male, no pleasure in his, society, in his society. She only tolerates him as necessary evil, and if he is killed, goes in quest of another in the most businesslike manner as he would go for the plumber or the glazier. In most cases, the male is the ornamental partner in the firm and contributes little of the working capital. There seems to be more equality of the sexes among the woodpeckers, wrens, and swallows, while the contrast is great as perhaps in the bobolink family, where the courting is done in the Arab fashion, the female fleeing with all her speed and the male pursuing with equal, equal precipitation, and were it not for the broods of young birds that appear, it would be hard to believe that the intercourse ever ripened in anything more intimate. Into anything more intimate. With the bluebirds, the male is useful as well as ornamental. He is the gay champion and escort of the female at all times, and while she is sitting, he feeds her regularly. It is very pretty to watch them building their nest. The male is very active in hunting out a place and exploring the boxes and cavities, but seems to have no choice in the matter, as is anxious only to please and to encourage his mate, who has the practical turn and knows what will do and what will not. After she has suited herself, he applauds her immensely, and away the two go in quest of material for the nest, the male acting as guard and flying above and in advance of the female. She brings all the material and does all the work of building, he looking on and encouraging her with gesture and song. He acts also as inspector of her work. 
but I fear is a very partial one. She enters the nest with her bit of dry grass or straw, and having adjusted it to her notion, withdraws and waits nearby while he goes in and looks it over. On coming out, he exclaims very plainly, Excellent! Excellent! And away the two go again for more material. <clears throat> the bluebirds, when they build about the farm buildings, sometimes come into contact with the swallows. The past season I knew a pair to take a force, take forcible possession of the domicile of a pair of the latter, the cliff species, that now stick their nests under the eaves of the barn. The bluebirds had been broken up in a little birdhouse nearby by the rats or perhaps a weasel, and being no doubt in, bat, in a bad humor and the season well in advance, they made forcible entrance into the abode tenement of their neighbors and held possession of it for some days, but I believe finally withdrew rather than live amid such a squeaky, noisy colony. I have heard that these swallows, when ejected from their homes in the way by the Phoebe bird, have been known to fall to and mason up the entrance to the nest while their enemy was inside it, thus having a revenge as complete and cruel as anything in human annals. The bluebirds and the house wrens more frequently come into collision. A few years ago, I put up a little birdhouse in the back, of my, back end of my garden for the accommodation of the wrens, and every season a pair of bluebirds looked into the tenement and lingered about several days, leading me to hope that they would conclude to occupy it. But they finally went away, and later in the season the wrens appeared, and after a little coquetting, were regularly installed in their old quarters and were as happy as only wrens can be. One of our younger poets, Myron Benton, sa saw a little bird ruffled with, with whirlwind of his ecstasies, which must have been the wren. And I know of no other bird that no so throbs and palpitates with music as this little vagabond. And the pair I speak of seemed exceptionally happy, and the male had a small tornado of song in his crop that kept him ruffled every moment in the day. But before their honeymoon was over, the bluebirds returned. I knew something was wrong before I was up in the morning. Instead of the voluble and gushing song outside the window, I heard the wren scolding and crying at a fearful rate, and on going out saw the bluebirds in possession of the box. The poor wrens were in despair. They wrung their hands and tore their hair after the wren fashion, but chiefly did they rattle out their disgust and wrath at the intruders. I have no doubt that if it could have been interpreted, it would have been proven the rankest and most valuable Billingsgate ever uttered, for the wren is saucy, and he has a tongue in his head that can outwag any other tongue known to me. Uh, the bluebird said nothing, but the males kept an eye on Mr. Wren, and when he came too near, gave chase, driving him to cover under the fence or under a rubbish heap or other object where the wren would scold and rattle away while his pursuer sat on the fence or the pea brush, waiting for him to reappear. Days passed, and the usurpers prospered, and the outcasts were wretched. But the latter lingered about, watching and abusing their enemies, and hoping, no doubt, that things would take a turn as they presently did. The outraged wrens were finally avenged. The mother bluebird had laid her full complement of eggs and was beginning to set, when one day, as her mate was perched above her on the barn, along came a boy with one of the wicked elastic slings and cut him down with a pebble. There he lay like a bit of sky fallen upon the grass. The widowed bird seemed to understand what had happened, and without much ado disappeared the next day in quest of another mate. How she contrived to make her wants known without trumpeting them about, I am unable to say. But I presume that the birds have a way of advertising that answers the purpose well. Maybe she trusted to luck to fall in with some stray bachelor or bereaved male who would undertake to console a widow of, or of one day's standing. I will say in passing that there are no bachelors from choice among the birds. They are all rejected suitors. While old, ma while old maids are entirely unknown, there is a jack to every jill and some to boot. 
The males being more exposed by their song and plumage and by being the pioneers in migrating seem to be slightly in excess lest the supply fall short and hence it sometimes happens that a few are bachelors perforce. There are not females enough to go around, but before the season is over, there are sure to be some vacancies in the martial ranks which they are called on to fill. In the meantime, the wrens were beside themselves with delight. They fairly screamed with joy. If the male was before ruffled with whirlwind of his ecstasies, he was now in danger of being rent asunder. He inflated his throat and caroled as Wren never caroled before, and the female too, how she cackled and darted about. How busy they both were! Rushing into the nest, they hustled those eggs out in less than a minute, Wren time. They carried in new material, and by the third day were fairly installed again in their old headquarters. But on the third day, so rapidly are these little dramas played by the female bluebird, reappeared with another mate. Ah, how the wren stock went down then! What dismay and despair filled again those little breasts! It was pitiful. They did not scold as before, but after a day or two withdraw, withdrew from the garden dumb with grief, and gave up the struggle. The bluebird, finding her eggs gone and her nest changed, seemed suddenly seized with alarm and shunned the box or else, finding she had less need for another husband than she thought, repented her rashness and wanted to dissolve the compact. But the happy bridegroom would not take the hint and exalted all his eloquence to comfort and reassure her. He was fresh and fond until this bereaved female found him. I am sure his suit had not prospered that season. He thought the box just the thing and that there was no need of alarm and spent days in trying to persuade the female back. Seeing he could not be a stepfather to a family, he was quite willing to assume a nearer relation. He hovered about the box. He went in and out. He called. He warbled. He entreated. The female would respond occasionally and come a light near and even peep into the nest but would not enter it and quickly flew again, flew away again. Her mate would reluctantly follow, but he would, was soon back uttering the most confident and cheering calls. If she did not come, he would perch above the nest and sound his loudest notes over and over again, looking in the direction of his mate and beckoning with every motion. But she responded less and less frequently. Some days I would see him only, but finally he gave it up, the pair disappeared, and the box remained deserted the rest of the summer. 1867. John Burroughs, The Bluebirds.